Coalition for Green Capital. Uh, really excited to have you join us for our webinar uh, this afternoon. Um, I am joined by uh, two excellent colleagues, Stacey Swan of Climate Finance Advisors and Doug Sims of the Natural Resource Def Defense Council. And we'll be presenting today on the paper we've jointly recently published on the topic of green and resilience banks. Uh, this paper describes the general concept of green and resilience banks but more specifically explores for the very first time the role that the Green Bank model can play in developing countries to help those nations meet their climate-related goals. Uh, this paper was presented for the first time several weeks ago uh, at COP22 in Morocco by Doug Sims, and we're thrilled to have you uh, join us today to discuss this paper in more depth with a broader audience. Um, and just as an FYI, the paper is downloadable in the handout section of the GoToWebinar interface. Um, and, but before going farther, I'd like to uh, properly introduce my co-leaders for the webinar and co-authors for the paper. Uh, first, we have Stacy Swan, CEO of Climate Finance Advisors, and Doug Sims, the Director of Strategy and Finance at the Natural Resource Defense Council Center for Market Innovation. And I'll allow each of them to say hello and try to provide a bit of background uh, before our proceeding. Uh, Stacy, uh, do you want to go first? Sure, thanks Jeff, um, and thank you to everyone who's attending and welcome to this presentation of, uh, of the paper on uh, green and resilience banks, how the green investment bank model can play a role in scaling up climate finance in developing and emerging economies. I'm Stacy Swan, I'm the CEO of Climate Finance Advisors. We are a consulting firm in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are um, climate uh, climate and finance um, experts uh, with a history in um, development finance in particular. My own background, um, I have more than 20 years experience as a project developer um, and as a fund manager um, and um, uh, spent some time in IFC as um, uh, creating and then leading what is now known as their blended finance unit, which is fairly similar in approach to what the green banks do. Um, takes public money to catalyze private investment, to go beyond business as usual for um, achieving um, climate smart impacts. I also spent a year at the U.S. Department of Treasury working on um, uh, the policy angle of climate finance and in particular bringing the practitioner's perspective to policies that can be um, practically applicable in this space, um, really to get finance flowing for climate smart investment. Um, I sit currently on the board of the Montgomery County Green Bank, which is the first uh, local county level green bank in the United States, um, and quite the model um, for how to set up and establish a financing mechanism to fill a gap at the local level, which is what we are um, talking about in this paper. I will turn it over now to Doug to give a brief introduction. Doug? Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Jeff. Doug Sims from NRDC. NRDC uh, is a 45-year-old environmental um, advocacy institution based in New York with offices around the U.S. and in Beijing and a strong India team launching in 2017 in India. Um, I've been involved in the, in the project finance space for 17 years versus a project finance lawyer at Allen & Overy, and for the last six years at NRDC, um, working at the Center for Market Innovation, where we focus on um, driving investment to um, climate smart um, infrastructure, um, including through means like institutions like green banks. I'm also on the standards board of the Climate Bonds Initiative and have been a part of um, efforts to create green banks in, in New York, in California, uh, India, Chile, and ongoing in other places. In partnership with um, CGC, um, we're, we're also part of the Green Bank Network, which is an international grouping of six global green banks, which, have been, which was formed in 2016 to increase uh, sharing between green banks and provide a roadmap for emerging green banks. Uh, very happy to be with you to discuss this, this paper. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doug, uh, and thanks, Stacey, too, for the uh, helpful introductions and background. And just to round it out, um, I'm Jeff Shubb, the Executive Director of the Coalition for Green Capital, or CGC. Uh, CGC is a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit that was founded uh, about nine years ago for the purpose uh, and mission of working with governments uh, to help create and stand up green banks, uh, which we've done in a number of states around the U.S. and increasingly outside the U.S., again, a lot of that in partnership with NRDC. 
Um, what our, you know, our mission comes down to developing the institutions, the products, uh, to drive as much private capital into clean energy investment and climate related investments as possible using uh, public capital wisely and efficiently to leverage that uh, private investment. Um, so really, uh, it's been a wonderful partnership with Climate Finance Advisors and NRDC on this paper. Um, for this webinar, um, Stacey's going to kick it off with the first portion, then I'll follow up, and then uh, Doug will take the last portion. Um, it should uh, take about 45 minutes for the presentation, and then it'll leave us plenty of time for questions. Um, just before diving in, just want to say that the development of this paper was an outgrowth of our joint work on the Green Bank Network, which Doug mentioned. Um, as the Green Bank model has become more well-known and has developed a more proven track record and attracted more attention, there's been growing interest in the last year in understanding how this institutional and finance model can be more broadly applied to new markets, specifically emerging markets and developing economies, and how can green banks serve as or support the creation of national nodes of climate-related investment from inside and outside the country to help those nations achieve their climate goals and the development goals, especially coming out of the Paris Agreements. And we believe that this could be a critical and potentially powerful model for helping countries achieve their NDCs. So this paper was really the first exploration of this important topic. Um, and then the last logistical note before diving in, I uh, just want to remind folks that you can submit written questions throughout the session through the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll take them at the end, um, and uh, I'll be uh, moderating those. Um, also, just one last note, we'll be hosting the same webinar for folks in the Asia Pacific region in a few weeks on Wednesday, January 11th at 11.30 a.m. AM Beijing time. Uh, we'll be sending out details for that registration, but if you have colleagues that you think might be interested in that part of the world, or if you're calling in from that part of the world and uh, you prefer to do this at a, a more a sensible time, uh, you can certainly do that. Um, and uh, with that, I'll end uh, my introductory remarks and hand it off to Stacy for the uh, presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'll, I'll start uh, uh, with um, presentation and give you a bit of uh, overview of what we will talk about today. Um, so um, there we go. All right, now the slides are all set. Um, so we'll have a bit of an introduction around the kind of the, the big challenge um, that these um, that this model is is meant to start to address and some of our key findings. Then we'll look at the role of the green investment bank uh, model, how to create and capitalize a green investment bank, both from the policy side and also from the funding side. Uh, some examples of products and tools that have been um, um, either already deployed or, or are being deployed in underserved markets where green banks can play a role. And then how this model, the green investment bank model, can help scale up climate finance. So that's the structure of this presentation. Um, I'll start with the introductions, the challenge, and the key findings. Um, so on slide four, here we are. Okay, so um, just a little bit of background. Um, the green investment bank model and green banks have been around for, um, for quite, a, quite a long time. The, the concept uh, really is meant to address um, some key challenges in shifting finance um, to meet uh, global climate goals. Um, the first one, of course, is the investment from fossil fuel to clean. The transition from um, to a low carbon economy will be um, expensive, um, but um, also requires private capital. Um, and if you can take public capital and blend it with private capital, we can actually meet the challenge of the low carbon transition. Um, the other needs, um, the other shifts that are required to meet climate goals, uh, really moving, in, and this is particularly true in emerging markets, really moving from centralized to distributed forms of um, energy, energy access, um, and, um, and supplying sources of energy to um, areas, rural areas and areas that are underserved, um, is a major gap and it, um, finance is needed to create that shift. On the resilient side, I would uh, argue that this is somewhat um, uh, a newer um, area. Uh, in the last four to five years, the international community has realized that um, a significant amount of warming is already locked in, and financing is needed to um, address the resilience um, of changes that we already know 
are likely to occur. And this model is uh, potentially applicable there. And then there's a, there's a, a correlation with, um, uh, let's say, macro efforts on greening finance and how do you integrate into the financial system climate considerations across not just the, the way that banks do their business, but the way that risk is managed by banks and institutional investors and asset managers. Green banks actually play a role um, in helping to um, catalyze those efforts um, in a complementary way, um, and this is this is important to understand. Um, green banks, um, as they are conceived, are part of a financial ecosystem and are filling a gap um, that doesn't currently exist. Um, they are specialized financial institutions or financial mechanisms which use public capital to catalyze private investment, um, and they really are meant to go beyond business as usual to help achieve some of these global climate goals, whether it's the transition to clean energy, um, whether it's the transition to energy access, or whether it's the need to build in resilience into other parts of, uh, of the built environment, including infrastructure and housing and water and other, other areas that um, have the potential to be exposed to climate risk. So um, there's also been a, an increasing recognition um, of the Green Bank model by global institutions. OECD has put out a number of reports um, on um, that have reinforced the, the Green Bank investment model, um, including the one they released last May. Um, the New Climate Economy papers that have been put out over the course of the last two years have also made reference to the Green Investment Bank model as part of their climate um, uh, recommendations and plans. Um, there's also interest growing from emerging markets. Um, here are a few examples of, um, of press releases from India and Canada and other parts of, of the world. Um, there is a strong recognition that the current banking system may not be going, uh, may not be investing as fast as needed, and dedicated financing mechanisms such as green investment banks might be useful in this case. So um, here's some more um, quotes from various reports um, about how this model can actually be value added in the ecosystem. Um, and the model itself really, um, from one perspective, is, is really about taking public capital to, to catalyze private investment to do something faster than would otherwise happen um, under normal circumstances. This is not something that is a concept that's, that's altogether new. Governments around the world have used their public capital to catalyze investment where they believe a public good can be created across many industries. So in, in one sense, you could argue that, um, that the act of putting out a, a mechanism to do something like this is being, has been done um, you know, for a very long time in a number of different industries. In this particular case, um, the usefulness is about, um, is about um, scaling up the um, efforts to address climate change on the mitigation side and the adaptation side. So just a quick overview of uh, some of the findings in our paper. Um, this model can fill a critical gap in the financial ecosystem at the local level. And in emerging markets, um, often you have a number of different financial actors who will go only so far down in, in terms of their investment um, um, size, let's say. And then they need partners in the market to execute further down the, the, the chain. Um, they need local financial institutions. They need a network of, of, um, of um, uh, let's say, microfinance institutions. And um, green investment banks can play a very interesting and critical role at that part in the financial ecosystem in emerging markets. Um, they are and can be a national and local solution to closing those financing gaps between the money, uh, the, the large money coming in and the, the projects on the ground, um, and they can play a critical role in scaling up low carbon and climate resilient, resilient investment. Um, they can help countries achieve their climate goals as articulated within the NDCs, and this is, this is fairly important. Um, if we already know that the costs require catalyzing and mobilizing private investment, 
green investment banks can be a really important actor to do so. Um, they can be a locus of financial innovation also because um, a number of different um, tools or products or approaches at the local need to be designed at the local level to meet the local needs. Um, and as I mentioned before, they can be a critical partner for international sources of climate finance, the DFIs in particular, and other channels that might be seeking to scale up their investments on the ground, but need need that partner to kind of bridge from their own um, their own sources to actual projects of a certain size. So our our one of the key findings of our paper is that they can be an interesting conduit um, in this in this context. Uh, between the international and national funding, we call that upstream, and the local project level funding downstream. So this slide is um, a schematic of, of what a public financing entity might look like um, uh, and what the um, areas it might address. Um, again, using limited public funds, working alongside private capital providers, um, accelerating the growth of low carbon and climate resilient markets. Um, so investing directly into clean energy projects, but also really trying to do that while deploying these public uh, funds most efficiently and maximizing private investments. So structuring their investments with an aim for minimizing any um, elements that could be, let's say, softer than the market, uh, maximizing private leverage, private capital, um, and really pushing investments, filling that, that financing gap to push investments, um, and in particular the risk-averse risk private capital into investments that wouldn't otherwise happen. Um, and in, by doing so, they are creating both a demonstration effect and they're implementing new market behavior and hopefully lowering the price um, and increasing demand. Just a few characteristics of green investment banks. Um, many of these were were initially um, uh, initially um, uh, reported in the in the OECD report um, green investment banks scaling up private investment in low carbon climate resilient infrastructure from 2016. Uh, our paper has added a few more characteristics that we found common among um, both uh, international facilities that are considered green investment banks and U.S. domestic green banks. Um, so the first is um, they're independent. So while they are cap capitalized with public capital, it's um, one of the key characteristics is that they are op they do operate in an independent fashion, um, in a way that is meant to to address the private sector and catalyze private investment. Uh, they have a narrow mandate. So unlike uh, potentially some larger banks who may be trying to work in a number of different sectors or a number of different areas, um, green investment banks are really targeted towards the objectives they are trying to meet um, and the investments they're trying to catalyze. Um, historically, this has been in clean energy, but we believe the model can also be expanded into low carbon and climate resilient investment and infrastructure. Um, they're cost effective. Uh, they're meant to be um, efficient um, and keep transaction costs down. Um, they're meant to provide additionality, and, and this is key. Um, like many of the development finance institutions, green investment banks will invest in, in projects um, and fill financing gaps where their financing is needed and market financing um, is unavailable. And what does that mean? It really means that if a project can be done with market-based financing, it should be done with market-based financing. Um, green investment banks historically have come in and filled the gap when uh, there has been a gap because of a certain amount of risk is unwilling to be taken by the private markets um, or, or a financing gap needs to be closed where the private markets will, will not come in. And by doing so, they're proving and demonstrating um, the, the value of the investment, but also hopefully um, uh, providing, um, through that demonstration effect, providing some comfort to future investors in similar projects. Um, they are accountable. Um, uh, green investment banks are um, driven by their narrow mandate and their impact um, requirements, and because of those things, they're accountable and are reporting on, on um, the types of investments they're making and the impacts that those investments are having. 
The next three characteristics we've we've added, and I've touched a little bit on this um, already, but the next one is designed to leverage private capital. Um, this is very important. Uh, much um, all of the green investment banks that currently exist are meant to um, really be um, crowding in private capital wherever they can, and this links back to the additionality point. Um, but um, I, the, the goal is really to make sure that um, you're not just crowding in other sources of public finance, but you're also crowding in specifically private capital. And, and through, those, um, through that leverage effect, um, you're maximizing the public dollars that you have, um, making the, them go farther than they would, and you're creating more, um, more uh, awareness and experience among private capital for those investments. The next characteristic is that they are built to serve local policy and market needs. Um, this is actually quite an interesting attribute. All of the green investment banks that have been established to date have been established as a response to local policy and market needs. Um, they weren't just set up because they somebody thought it was an interesting idea. They were actually set up as a solution to deliver on a policy objective, um, and one that was meant to, to do so with the private sector catalyzing a market, bringing in private um, investments along the way, um, really being a, let's see, a turnkey approach to bridging policy with action, with investment and private sector. So that's a very important characteristic. And the final one, um, each of these to date has been capitalized with public funds um, as a policy response or mechanism that um, follows from a policy response. There have been some initial capitalizations with public uh, public funds, um, um, although additional, let's say, philanthrop philanthropic or let's say patient capital is also um, uh, there's also a potential to capitalize some of these green investment banks or financial mechanisms with that type of money. I'll turn it over now to Jeff. Um, to take it from here, um, Jeff. Great, thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, really uh, excellent background, especially the description of the attributes. Uh, you, you captured it really well. Um, I'll take over from here to talk a little bit about the green bank institutions that do exist, um, a little bit about how they operate and how they uh, came to be, um, and then talk a little bit about the process for actually creating and capitalizing green banks uh, before turning it over to Doug to talk a little bit more about uh, the products and activities of, that green banks actually take on and uh, how those can be used and adapted for uh, new kinds of markets. Um, so as of the end of 2015, uh, the OECD reported that there were 13 in gre uh, green investment banks uh, around the world, uh, some of which are local and others are national in their jurisdiction. Um, they all have a common set of principles and attributes that Stacy just ran through. Um, but they're all created by local policymakers as part of a broader set of solutions uh, implemented to address specific market failures and barriers preventing LCR investment in those markets, um, which is to say they have uh, a similar DNA, similar approaches, use a lot of the same tools, but they really are um, all tailored um, and different in, in some ways to, to meet their local market needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the common attributes that runs across all the green banks that do exist is that they really do address common challenges. Why are markets growing slowly? What are the barriers uh, to uh, investment? Uh, what are the barriers to demand that they can address? Um, and this uh, slide shows how, how they're kind of segmented across different parts of the clean energy spectrum. Um, for instance, in utility or large commercial industrial renewable projects, especially those that are sponsored by SMEs, um, they very often lack the ability to, to provide guarantees or equity. Um, they have a lack of track record. It's, it's complex to underwrite and assess the risk of, uh, of small, medium enterprises that aren't, you know, credit rated or something like that. Um, so there's that inherent challenge for, uh, un, for banks and other traditional capital sources to actually move into that market for that reason. Um, for distributed small and medium scale renewable energy projects, um, there's uh, very often a lack of interest from financial institutions uh, because these projects are small. Um, small disaggregated projects with different technologies are inherently 
uh, more complex to assess and evaluate if you're a lender. Um, and it means you have to invest uh, time in your staff to understand the risks and the cash flows of these projects. Um, and inherently, this is just not as cost effective as investing in uh, really large, well-known technologies. And so that creates a barrier for um, capital coming into the space or it is uh, inherently more expensive uh, for capital that comes into this space. Um, the difficulty perceiving the economic benefits is also an important challenge where um, lenders might, or capital providers might not uh, fully understand uh, how there's an economic uh, savings that come from these kinds of investments and that that produces value for the borrower that can then translate back to a uh, higher um, chance of repayment for the investors. Um, a lot of those same challenges exist for energy efficiency, um, but then add in a couple of challenges that um, there's a perception uh, that the payback periods are, are too long. Um, that's a challenge both from the uh, investor side and from the demand side. Um, it's hard to perceive the economic benefits and often there's kind of a, a perception that maybe these savings that would come from energy efficiency aren't real. Um, in many parts of the world, there's um, the ESCO model, uh, where uh, shared uh, savings agreements are used. Um, this model is just not particularly mature and developed in a lot of parts of the world where um, in you know, countries like the U.S., there's a robust ESCO market so that uh, large uh, creditworthy um, companies can uh, get really available financing and efficiency upgrades, but without this ESCO industry in full swing in other countries, um, there are challenges serving that market too. Uh, next slide, please. And so we see, despite um, uh, common principles and core challenge and common challenges that they're all trying to address, uh, many of the green banks were actually created um, with slightly varying missions and objectives based on their local markets. Um, these six green banks that are up here are the, the members of our green bank network. Um, so we'll just highlight those to give a sense of, of the range of uh, intentions. Um, Australia, their Clean Energy Finance Corporation is meant to accelerate the transformation of Australia into a more competitive economy with less carbon. So inherently there's an economic competition element uh, tied into a climate change uh, based objective. Um, in Japan, for instance, uh, the goal is very specifically to support the development of local communities and address slow economic growth. Um, obviously, it's a climate-oriented organization, um, but its mission is very much about local economic growth. Um, in Connecticut, uh, it's very explicitly, uh, the Green Bank is very explicitly tackling uh, climate change, um, and it specifically has the uh, objective of reducing energy costs, which is uh, not true uh, across all of the other Green Banks. Um, New York is very focused on uh, transforming the capital market sector and thinks of the finance sector as, as its key stakeholder to address. Um, and then the UK is uh, kind of similar to Australia with the goal of being green and profitable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, together, these six institutions uh, cumulatively have uh, use about $6 billion of uh, green bank capital uh, to mobilize a total of $22 billion uh, for clean energy investment around the world. Um, the leverage ratios, meaning the ratio of private to public capital, varies uh, across institutions. Um, some of them are uh, uh, three or four X, some are up to 10 X or 11 X for certain investments and products, uh, really wide range, but they all are achieving the objective of uh, leveraging private investment. Next slide, please. Um, what are they all investing in? Uh, well, it's a really uh, good mix of technologies. This is a pre preliminary estimate that NRDC and CGC put together based uh, just on the six member countries uh, that are in the Green Bank Network. Um, as you see, uh, the largest share is actually to offshore renewables. The UK Green Investment Bank is, uh, I believe, the largest investor in offshore wind in the world. Um, uh, followed by uh, waste and bioenergy, uh, which is a mix across all the green banks, energy efficiency right after that, and then onshore renewables, uh, primarily in the form of solar. So we see a really wide range of technologies that green banks are addressing. Next slide, please. Uh, we can move on to uh, looking at how these were actually created and what's their structure and what's their capitalization. Again, all different. Um, some of the green banks are 
what you can call quasi-public, where they are independent of governments but have a board that uh, is either appointed to or appointed by or reports to government. Um, this uh, is broadly true of Australia, Connecticut, um, New York, uh, excuse me, um, uh, UK. Um, New York is actually directly part of government as well as um, uh, the GFO in Japan and Green Tech Malaysia. Um, being part of government has uh, certain benefits, it has certain challenges, being quasi public has benefits and challenges. Um, in a lot of cases, the method for creating the Green Bank and the structure adopted is based on um, political and policy calculus uh, at the time of creation, uh, what are the pathways open, um, as well as a concern about governance. Um, the capitalization sources of all the green banks um, varies uh, a little bit. Um, sometimes it's directly just government funds, uh, like in Australia or Green, uh, green Tech Malaysia or the UK, where effectively just a budget appropriation was uh, given to uh, the green bank. But in other cases, um, carbon pricing mechanisms and uh, cap and trade systems are used to raise revenue and put in and put into the green banks or utility bill surcharges, as was the case in Connecticut or New York, where existing uh, fairly large uh, surcharges were in place to collect funds for efficiency rebate programs and a portion of those dollars were redirected specifically for uh, green bank financing. And some of them were capitalized with one time upfront slugs of money. Some of them have ongoing indefinite streams, um, which is all to say there, there's no one single way to do this. Uh, next slide. And so what, what are the underlying legal approaches that have been taken? Um, this uh, legislation uh, has been used in a number of cases. Australia was created through legislation. Um, New York actually took a regulatory and administrative approach where um, they created their green bank um, simply by administrative action where um, the New York State Energy Office already had the authority to do the kinds of lending and finance that was desired. And so they just said New York Green Bank now exists as a division of, of government. Um, but to get the money uh, to capitalize the Green Bank, uh, specifically the ratepayer dollars from collected by utilities, they had to go through the regulatory process. Um, so there are a combination of techniques were used. Um, and then also importantly, the uh, hybrids can be used where in Connecticut, for instance, um, legislation was passed to form the Connecticut Green Bank, but it was actually uh, formed out of an existing entity and repurposed that entity. So in not all cases is a brand new entity actually needed. Uh, next slide. Um, and then finally, capitalization sources. We, we talked about these um, a little bit. Uh, for domestic sources, um, budgetary funds, cap and trade or carbon tax revenue, um, utility surcharges is a method that's been used in the US, um, although it might have um, kind of narrow applicability more broadly. Um, as we look to um, uh, you know, uh, countries that have national development banks, which the US does not, um, uh, they can directly fund or uh, capitalize a, a green bank in their country. And then looking at the international sources, and this is where I think it's important to start thinking uh, uh, creatively about how the green bank model can be applied broadly to new parts of the world. Um, green banks can be capitalized with uh, philanthropy um, from international donor assistance, um, institutional investors, uh, pension funds, other private investors um, looking for you know uh, modest uh, returns over a long period of time. Um, these can be leveraged, uh, these funds can be brought in with green bonds, and we can talk about that more later. Um, but also a significant uh, pool of capital out there that green banks could tap into are climate finance funds. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are about uh, 100 climate funds uh, out there in the world now, including the Green Climate Fund, which was created as part of the UN climate framework. Um, often the capital is concessional and it's missioned aligned very specifically what green investment banks are trying to do. Um, each of these funds does have the ability to support national level green investment banks. They really could be a um, ideal receptacle for these funds in many ways. Um, and the funds are allowed to on-lend and provide guarantees and other risk-sharing uh, mechanisms, which again is really well suited for green banks. Um, and so using these funds to capitalize green investment banks can really support the enabling environment and capacity building in local markets, which is really 
uh, what is essential here and why having nation-based or local institutions in developing and emerging markets is so important. It's about developing and building up the local capacity and enabling environment for a clean energy and uh, climate-related investments uh, market growth. Um, and so having being able to draw upon the funds uh, around the world that are purpose-built to do just that seems like an ideal fit between fund and institution uh, model. Um, and I think with that, I will uh, turn it over to Doug to dive more deeply into the specific uh, finance products that Green Banks use. Thanks, Jeff. Next slide, please. So what, okay, so that's great. So what might, um, how might the Green Bank model um, evolve to um, emerging markets? What we know now, there's three main typologies of green bank investment strategies that allow them to achieve their goals of um, crowding in private capital. And they really fall in two main categories. Um, one is um, risk mitigation, um, which is, which is um, reducing the risks um, of new investors getting into these, these kinds of investments. And the other one um, is enabling transactions to go forward, transaction enablers. Not strictly speaking, um, risk mitigants, but things that enable investors to um, have an investment that fits into the format in which they're accustomed and used to, to enable them to get um, get into the sector where they previously haven't been involved. So, and specifically, that means that credit enhancement, um, you'll have typically uh, private capital, which is uh, senior, which means that its um, its claims um, to cash flows are um, first, and then the green bank. Um, will get involved and they'll provide uh, what's called the credit enhancement. That can be an agreement to um, pay for the losses of the loan up to a certain percentage. Um, for example, it's called a loan loss reserve. And so, for example, when if a project, if an energy efficiency project um, has not been, uh, has not passed sort of the traditional, the traditional or um, well established underwriting features that lenders used to. They may not want to invest, and so the green bank can come in and say, "Listen, for these early transactions, we will absorb some of the losses." And this is a, a tool which has been used to great success in in Connecticut. Um, the other, another way to um, bring investors in is through co-investment. That means investing alongside of um, a private capital provider um, to reduce the overall capital requirements um, from the private sector. And also, really importantly, when the green bank gets involved in a transaction. They have specialized expertise in understanding the asset, which they actually um, uh, share with the private sector um, partner as they develop, uh, as, as they um, extend the financing. So, for example, um, a story which the UK Green Bank often says is when they first entered um, operations, many um, private providers thought if the Green Bank's involved, well, then it must be the project's got something wrong with it. But since they've been operating successfully in areas like offshore wind um, and really pioneering expertise in that area, um, it's often said now that the Green Bank is not involved. There may be something that's not kosher with the transaction. So it's really about trans transferring that knowledge to the private sector in a way that's, that's more rapid than would otherwise occur with the normal um, market forces. Um, another really important transaction enabler is um, aggregation in warehousing. Uh, small projects, as was noted earlier, really um, have a difficult time getting financing for a number of reasons. And um, one reason is that some of, the, some of the capital providers that would like to invest in the sector need a certain transaction size. So one thing that the green banks have been doing in certain cases, particularly um, in, in Connecticut again, and um, has, been, has been to uh, finance themselves on their own balance sheet small projects collect them into a warehouse, and then sell the portfolio of projects to an investor. And this has been very successful. And also, once, once, this, is, once this has been done, this, original, um, this, original, this origination by the Green Bank, has been shown in Connecticut, the next time around, private capital providers themselves can create the warehouse. And there's also some interesting structures which are, have been put in place um, called WHEEL, which essentially is um, allowing um, private capital providers to create a pool of capital which can be accessed if um, a, a state actor provides some, some credit support to allow um, um, different states to come into the, 
into the portfolio. Uh, so these are some of the types, these are the main ways that GIBs um, get involved in transactions. And I should note that um, they, um, banks have a wide variety of debt and equity um, interventions, which we'll see in more detail in, in coming slides. Next slide, please. So a note on green bonds. This is this is something people often ask: How are green bonds and green banks connected? Um, a bond is just a an obligation, a debt obligation of an issuer, and a green bond is the same um, as any other bond except it has a green plus factor. What do I mean is the same? It means that a green bond, every bond um, has a certain a credit uh, rating or credit um, profile attached. Now they're not all rated, but, but they all have a credit profile. A green bond is just a bond that um, is, has its proceeds segregated to be dedicated towards green projects. Um, and it also has a um, the characteristic of um, typically having some reporting obligations to the investors about how, how the bond is performing. So the, the, any bond um, issued by um, a green bank could be a green bond if it meets the market's issuance requirements. And the, the market, um, there's something called the green bond principles, which describes really the, um, the segregation of proceeds, the reporting requirements, the assets which can be green, and really puts out um, sort of a voluntary framework for issuers to fit into the green bond mold. So uh, green banks issue green bonds when they meet those requirements. So what, what do green bonds present? They present an opportunity to access domestic international capital um, that wants to be exposed to sustainable assets. And there's a growing list of investors um, and, and the, a number of trillion institutional investors who, who have expressed desire to increasingly green their portfolios which represents a major opportunity to have access to different kinds of international capital and also to and, and local markets to try to um, develop uh, markets in which these green, these green capital markets. Um, green, GIBs have used green bonds to, um, to refinance their portfolio. So for example, when you do a warehousing facility um, of loans, you can actually use the green bond markets to um, essentially sell down the position and um, recycle the capital into other projects. Uh, GIBs have also played a role in creating liquidity in green bond markets. One of the big, one of the big issues is um, when you buy a green bond, um, can, are there other folks who want to trade that bond? And so, green, so as we'll see in, in the next slide, the green banks have actually bought green bonds to try to increase liquidity in the market. And actually, the, uh, Brazil the yesterday announced um, a facility um, to from its, from its local domestic bank, BNDS, to purchase green bonds. So next slide, please. So what are some specific interventions which green bonds have done, green banks have done? We're going to go through these pretty quickly. But depending on the context, um, the, the goal of the market, the banks do different things. In Malaysia, where there's really very little commercial bank lending, um, the Malaysian, Malaysia Green Tech, which is a green, early green bank, created a program which really was driving towards just getting banks comfortable with investing um, in, green, in the green space. This is, a, this is a, what's called a standard offer scheme where um, essentially um, different kinds of borrowers would get green certificates uh, which would mark them as having green projects and they brought those certificates to a commercial bank. That bank would get certain kinds of subsidies um, from Green Tech Malaysia to encourage them to invest. And the result of that um, has been very successful. They've been able to bring in um, complete 248 projects, probably north of that now. And then also they've attracted, um, you know, a couple of dozen risk-adverse banks into this into the sector. This kind of program isn't particularly sustainable because it's a subsidy program, but it's a first step in Malaysia, which has been successful in getting lenders in, into the space. Next slide, please. Um, in Japan, there's a real desire. There's been a real desire for for the green finance organization to uh, increase distributed renewable energy deployment and, and de development. Excuse me, um, particularly in areas um, that have been affected by natural disasters. So there's, there's a lack of developers of projects in in Japan, and so the, the the green fund realized that if they provided equity in the projects directly and through sub funds they would actually um, both um, be able to work with developers to help them understand how to, how to attract further capital, 
and also um, allow those, those developers to reduce their equity requirements and attract more debt. So that's also been very successful. Um, they've been, they've been um, investing 78 um, million um, yen, sorry, USD equivalent, um, and have uh, gotten projects um, almost at 700, 700 million as of um, earlier this year with a big carbon impact. They've, they've really brought in a, a suite of new investors um, that have not um, previously been in the space. Next slide, please. In the UK, um, and, and in many places in, in developed markets, there's been a desire to draw in pension funds into the sector. Pension funds um, and other institutional investors um, really talk about wanting to invest in infrastructure, but it's hard for them to do so for a variety of reasons. Um, so the UK's intervention really sought to try to bring these investors in. The UK started out um, seeing a different problem in the market. And, and the initial projects in offshore wind in the UK, there's only a few utilities who had the ability and the experience to do offshore wind. And their capital got tied up in the, in, in the early projects. So the first UK investments were really to, tr to create liquidity and an exit for those sponsors to be able to reinvest their, in other projects. Um, that evolved, that strategy, as, as the UK GIB became more experienced and competent into a fund, um, a fund strategy where they um, would create a fund and seed, um, put some seed capital into a fund and bring in other institutional investors who had not um, previously been investing in this space. And that fund, um, this actually, this, this, this statistic is, is, should be updated, but it's been very successful. Um, it's brought in a number of um, pension funds um, sovereign wealth funds and others into the offshore wind space, um, increasing the capital there remarkably. Next slide, please. I mentioned this before, I once well in it. Australia has wanted to develop the asset backed security market, which, um, according to the work done by the OECD and others, um, will be really key to bringing in um, sufficient capital to distributed um, energy, energy assets. And so to help support this market being developed in Australia, um, the, the, uh, uh, the Australian um, Clean Energy Finance Corporation actually purchased 20 million in certified green bonds by an issuer um, which had an innovating approach, uh, uh, an innovative underlying asset strategy which, in, which combined rooftop solar and storage. It also was the first certified climate bond um, on securitization in Australia and, and observed, and this, this issuance actually observed some pricing benefit to the issuer. Next slide. So quickly to talk about what might a green bank look like in emerging markets. Um, what we see in emerging markets is the same problem as we have in developed markets, but only more of them. So unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of capital providers with clean technologies, even more difficulty in accessing credit risk because there's probably, there may not be um, as fulsome um, credit rating systems and other assessment tools. There's really a lack of proven business models. So a lot of the models that have been developed in, um, in the developed world um, based on things like property ownership and, and, and tax systems may not be directly applicable to the two emerging markets. And how do you actually um, get those players who, who have some innovative ideas, capital, capital they need without a track record? Again, lack of liquidity for investment exits. How do you, how do you actually um, exit investment where um, the overall um, opportunity to um, bring other investors in is limited. There's perception of risk of implementation, uh, political risk, currency risk. It's hard to aggregate small projects. Some, some, some of these newly emerging risks, particularly on the Brazilian side, are hard to insure against. How do you actually properly get insurance for these infrastructure investments? And of course, there's a huge issue of energy access and energy infrastructure lack of energy infrastructure in some of these markets, which really is a development driver, and how do you, how do, you do that? Um, and then the overall investment policy, uh, climate and policy framework. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously, the GIB model can't address um, many of these um, in isolation. It's really part of an ecosystem. But um, we think based on the experience of um, some, 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 earlier, some early efforts and also um, leveraging the experience of the green banks and developed markets, there are a few ways where the model could really help scale up climate finance in emerging markets. One, um, facilitation. It help countries meet climate goals articulated within their NDCs. Um, each country will need um, a, a center of gravity in implementing and designing their NDCs. 
particularly in trying to figure out what is the pipeline of, of projects um, and making sure those projects are bankable and economically viable. So having a specialized green finance institution can help, can help do that um, and focus attention and resources on, on, on that, even, even where, in, where existing institutions may or may not um, have that, that sole focus and, and, and galvanizing effect. Mobilization. Um, can the, the, green, the Green Bank could serve as really the center of financial innovation. As we're going to see in the next slide, there are, there's a lot of innovation going on uh, around the world trying to understand how to mobilize capital. Um, but there still needs to be a focus point for this innovation. Otherwise, it risks um, not being implemented in a systematic way or not being expanded beyond the markets where it, where it was originally developed. Uh, thirdly, coordination. There's a lot of capital sources that are looking to invest in emerging markets, um, and having a, a partner, a locally controlled partner on the ground um, to look at different sources of finance, be those, be those multilateral international finance, be that national development bank finance, be it local capital markets, philanthropy, local banks, um, coordinating these, these um, investors um, and, and layering and lending their capital could be a role um, that these, these institutions could assume. Next slide, please. So uh, these are some examples of some innovations going on. I'm not going to get it going to them in, in any, deta any detail, but essentially, um, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening on currency side, energy, sav energy savings insurance. Next slide, please. Um, obviously, the, the really critical issue in, um, in, in, in Africa and, and Asia and other places is, you know, access to um, the bottom of the pyramid. Um, consumers who need access to energy, and so the GCF is doing some very, very green bank-like things and working with um, some early um, innovators in that area. Um, other things, other big challenges, transition away from diesel. So there's all this innovation is going on, and, and the green banks, um, you know, are not, you know, the only way of, of bringing forth these innovations, but the green banks are created either within um, existing institutions or as new institutions, they can actually that actually serve to um, have a network effect among the, among each, among the banks themselves, um, and also serve that important point of layering and blending capital, and also making sure the innovation that is developed in one area in the world actually is picked up and implemented in another area. So, um, next slide, please. This is the final slide. This is just sort of summarizing the presentation, showing the green bank model as it currently exists, now how it may evolve. Um, to coordinate um, and blend various sources of capital as it deploys uh, market knowledge to help stoke demand on the one hand and also um, reduce the perception and, and the reality of risks for, for new investors in the space. So I'm gonna, we're going to wrap up now and we're going to have Jeff um, um, take, take, questions, take questions from you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Really uh, appreciate uh, the excellent uh, wrap up there on those last sections. I think you really did a great job of highlighting uh, the critical role green investment banks can play and what we found in our research are specific opportunities through different uh, finance techniques to drive more private investment into this space. Um, so now we will uh, look at the questions. We've got a good number of questions and so I will um, I'll go through the list and uh, Doug and Stacy will uh, I'll, uh, just ask you each to jump in. Um, so the first question is um, perhaps the most important question that a person could ask about green banks is, is there any substantive proof that GIBs are having the effect of, quote, infecting other non-GIB lenders to make it increasingly easy for green projects to be funded? Um, I think uh, Doug touched on this a bit, but I think highlighting a couple of specific examples would be really great to underline uh, how this process really works. Um, I can think of a few uh, examples, uh, but Doug or Stacey, if you want to identify a few, that would be great. Well, um, this, I guess is what I mentioned is, I think, very clear is not so much lenders, but um, Clearly, in the in the UK, the offshore wind space, there's been a lot of investors um, who have not invested in that space coming in. I think Jeff, you'll probably speak to some some of the Connecticut examples. Um, you know, there's an increasing amount of examples in all these jurisdictions um, of it. I mean, I think one of the things which uh, 
is 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 a challenge to measure, but is um, really important to measure is market transformation impacts. Um, you know, there's there's ways to look at um, how many transactions have been completed in a certain asset class, you know, before and after the intervention, the number of the number of different um, providers that are in the market after after this, after the intervention, and there's a number of ways of measuring it. But I don't think there's um, you know, also just look at the amount of capital that's being leveraged. I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it. So I, I don't know, Jeff, you want to give some more and say some more specific examples? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, to your, to your point, Doug, about the, you know, how do you measure market transformation? I agree, it's, it's hard. I don't know what the metric is for that. Um, but there are, you know, a, a number of specific examples. Um, one uh, that I can think of from Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut Green Bank found in, I think it was 2014, that there was, uh, there were solar leasing uh, products on the market for rooftop distributed solar, but there was no solar loan market uh, product on the market. And so the Green Bank found uh, an origination partner who was in the business of um, selling solar loan products, uh, but had no capital to do it. And so the Green Bank uh, provided a $5 million initial pilot fund for them uh, to test the market. Um, they ran through that uh, $5 million very quickly in I think less than a year. And that uh, origination partner was then able to go to a, a private lender and say, hey, look at this uh, market viability we've shown, look at what we've done with just $5 million. And they provided a warehouse of over a million, $100 million for that lender to go out and operate in five states in the region beyond just Connecticut. Um, and then add on to that, that the Connecticut Green Bank was actually able to uh, effectively securitize and sell off the, its own $5 million loan assets I think that really demonstrates the kind of catalytic nature that green banks can have where a $5 million investment uh, in its own state led to, I think it was $120 or $150 million loan fund to cover multiple states for a product that effectively didn't exist before. Um, and there's a number of specific examples like that. Um, again, the, you know, the broader transformative effect of uh, having uh, capital providers come in and participate with green banks uh, that wouldn't have done so otherwise, that's a little bit harder to measure. Um, but I think these stories of where, you know, effectively a green bank can uh, engage in a market, uh, demonstrate success, and then, you know, ultimately leave that market, which is what Connecticut did in this case, um, and be kind of filled in with more private capital is exactly the dynamic we're after. I, I would to, add oh, also... Go ahead, Stacey, first. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I mean... Um, I think that um, the concept and the uh, of how to measure this is indeed somewhat um, uh, what is the metric to prove market transformation is indeed some something that's um, fairly difficult to kind of pin down although I will say that in um, in the space of blended finance um, which is in function is, is what green investment banks do they blend they take public capital, blend it with private to catalyze something that wouldn't otherwise happen um, faster than it would otherwise happen with the intention of creating enough demonstration effect so that private investors um, the next time come in without the need for uh, green investment bank capital or that public capital to be in there. That function is something that's done in a number of different development institutions. And while the development institutions aren't themselves technically green banks um, uh, because their mandates are broad and they're working across a number of different areas, um, th that approach has actually um, had the effect of, let's say, infecting other um, non-green bank, non-climate you know, climate or, or green investment bank lenders um, and has created in some places um, some real um, interesting and important case studies on how that type of funding has created that type of transformation. And I'll be more specific. Um, uh, in 2008, uh, some climate investment fund money was used to um, catalyze wind investment in Mexico at a point in time when the market um, had perceived an increased risk uh, because of a number of different factors, not least of which was the financial crisis. Um, that money went in. Um, it enabled projects that might have otherwise been shelved and scrapped. Um, to go forward. 
The next time the government in this particular region did a tender for wind, it was oversubscribed several times over, and no public capital was needed um, for the future investments. And when polls were done of some of the folks that tender that that submitted bids for that uh, follow-on tender, um, some of the investors explicitly said that the projects that had been implemented and financed through the 2008 to 2012 period um, had not just kind of gone forward, but had been had proven the kind of regulatory and policy and legal environment to be safe. They felt comfortable in the follow-on rounds to put in their capital without the same types of, of um, uh, CTF money. So in in a in a way, that kind of is a the same function that a green investment bank would do in many of the markets um, that it that it operates. The ability to measure that type of market transformation takes years. You your investment takes um, you know, you make an investment, the investment needs to be built, then additional invest, investments need to be put in, in play and investors need to be able to see proof that those first investments or those initial investments actually have been successful, not just from a commercial perspective, but from a legal and regulatory perspective. All of those things build confidence in the markets and that's the role that the, the green investment banks uh, would be playing in this, this context. Yeah, so thank you. A really, that's a very uh, good and thorough answer. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so the next question, uh, which is a really uh, good one that we didn't address specifically, is do GIVs finance projects abroad or are they strictly local? Um, I'll give a quick answer to this and then ask Doug to chime in um, on a specific example of the UK. Um, all the green banks that exist were that were created um, at their at, when they were initially created, their intention was that they only finance projects within their jurisdiction. So um, the Australia Green Bank only would finance projects within Australia, same with Malaysia, uh, Connecticut, New York. Um, but this is actually um, being, uh, that truth will not hold uh, permanently anymore because the UK Green Investment Bank is starting to uh, move into markets outside the UK. Um, I think Doug probably knows the most about that. So do you wanna share a little bit about that transition, Doug? Doug, are you on mute, perhaps? <laughs> yes, I was. Thank you. <laughs> My back now. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, so um, the UK uh, GIB um, you know, is um, authorized um, via a, a, a structure with the UK government to, to explore opportunities in India and um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think that's, that's underway, and I, and I think um, many of the – and basically the reason why that was done is because the UK government really liked the way um, – the result it was seeing in the UK and authorized the UK GIB to, 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 to develop a similar approach um, outside of the UK to, to help the UK comply with its um, obligations and ambitions um, in uh, to the, the support the development of markets in, in those areas in those areas so I think you know I don't to my knowledge there's not any announced investments yet but that that um, is ongoing um, and and I think it's important to note also Jeff maybe is that uh, in the U.S., even though there's a geographic limitation to most of the banks, um, some of the partners are national partners, like Cannon Armstrong in Connecticut. So, in effect, um, some of the and, and the sort of the wheel program. So, in effect, there are some uh, out-of-state effects um, through the, the investments that GIBs are making with some of their national partners. Yeah, so it's a very good point, Doug. That just because the um, the green banks are focused on local markets doesn't mean that the uh, partners and capital providers uh, that are um, operating in partnership with the green bank, they're not necessarily just uh, focused in those markets. They could be national or international uh, companies as well. Um, so I think a, a good follow-on question to that is, um, can the green bank model be applied at the city or regional level, or does it have to be at the national level? Um, and I think, uh, Stacey, given your position on the Montgomery County uh, Green Bank Board, I think uh, you were probably best positioned to give an answer to that. That's a great question, and, and I would say yes. Um, I, I think the model itself um, is meant to fill a gap in the financial ecosystem, and if there, that gap exists at the municipality level or the county level or the state level or the federal level, I think the model can be applicable. Um, 
it's really, again, it's about kind of um, taking kind of public capital and catalyzing private investment, but the narrow mandate is also very important, meaning it's a focused facility to achieve certain objectives, um, and whether it's clean energy, whether it's low carbon climate resilient investments, um, whether it's um, resilience generally, um, there's been a number of discussions in the last uh, six, nine, 12 months about building in resilience and infrastructure, a green bank model that has been articulated in these slides would be completely applicable to something like that as well. Um, so um, it, it's a model. It's a model to create a function in the ecosystem. Um, and where it sits in the ecosystem, it's addressing the needs of, of its target market. So I would say in the Montgomery County Green Bank, um, the county um, council, which is the governing body, the governing political body of the county, deemed that this would be a useful part of the financial ecosystem in the county to scale up clean energy investments in the jurisdiction faster than it would happen otherwise, um, addressing critical market gaps and market needs um, across the, the county and its, um, its um, residents, um, including low-income housing and certain parts of the um, certain parts of the county that are might potentially otherwise be left out. Um, and that it was a deliberate um, uh, design function of this model for the county. So yes, I think the model can be applied at the city level, at the regional level, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, I think um, it, it's about where where the need is in the, in the financial ecosystem. Hey Jeff, let me just jump in quickly here on this. Um, I think in New York City, you know, there's a city, uh, what, what effectively is a municipal green bank in an institution called NYSEEC, the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation, which, um, you know, was capitalized um, initially by some, um, some funds from the federal federal government under the Recovery Act, and has since been um, taking taking on um, capital from philanthropy and others. And interesting just to note what Stacy was saying about. Um, you know how these institutions can um, can be designed to to, to really uh, really crack some hard to reach sectors. So that you know the NYSEEC started working a lot in um, in in sort of the certain size of building in New York City, commercial buildings and, and residential buildings. Um, most recently, last last week, it was announced a very interesting deal that they closed or announced maybe it's not closed um, with. Um, uh, a public housing um, or, or low-income housing um, developer a, and a developer of, of microgrid projects to do to finance uh, a mic uh, I'm sorry a, a, a large battery as part of a microgrid that includes solar and I think some CHP um, in, a, in, a, in a large low-income housing project in, in Brooklyn and the the other part of the financing the sorry the, the credit of the financing comes from Con Ed and Con Ed uh, has was able to get um, an approval from New York, the New York State regulator, to instead of building a new substation in a, in a new demand area, to actually uh, invest in demand response and energy efficiency. So this this microgrid is actually lowering costs for residents and also providing um, services to the grid. So it's a really interesting model. That kind of innovative. Financing is the kind of things which, and blending of capital, which, um, and blending of different, including incentives, is, is what green banks really excel at. Yeah, Doug, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the the NYSEEC model because you know, a question we're often asked is, could you have a city or local or a county uh, green investment bank in the same market where there's a you know a, a green bank at a higher level of government? And New York is an example of just that. It's, you know, the New York Green Bank and NYSEEC, um, you know, it's not called a Green Bank, but it uses the same techniques. Um, and I think it shows a really good, um, it's a good example of how these entities coexist. Um, you know, they have slightly different mandates and missions and, you know, NYSEEC, uh, you know, <laughs> there's plenty of building energy efficiency need and opportunity in New York City. And so having a, a locally controlled, locally built institution specifically to hit that target market uh, within a state that more broadly has a green bank, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it also kind of reflects the reality of um, how, you know, capital markets are structured and the vertical supply chain of capital that exists, that, you know, there's a need for 
uh, more capital to flow at the institutional level, at the wholesale level, and even at the retail level. Um, so injecting kind of green bank practices uh, throughout that entire supply chain, um, I think has a lot of value. Um, I think we'll do, uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, the, as one that just came in that I think is a really important one is, what do you see as the role of green investment banks in providing critical technical assistance to scale up clean energy investments? Um, Stacy, do you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, sure. I um, well, I think kind of as a particularly in emerging markets. Um, although I guess this could apply, you know, in in um, developed markets as well. Um, just having a financing source is not always going to scale a market. In fact, quite the opposite. You need a number of different complementary um, efforts to build awareness, build pipeline, um, build structure deals that may be blending not just the green bank type of funding, but incentives that might be, um, you know, well-meaning from the federal government but hard to transact around. Um, so there's a number of different complementary, let's say, technical assistance or capacity building efforts that are needed to, to actually scale up investment, uh, clean energy investment or low carbon resilient investment. Um, and the financing is not enough by itself, um, particularly when you are talking smaller projects, when you're scaling into new, either new technologies or new markets. Um, uh, how much technical assistance and how it's designed it really depends on the context of the market itself, the level of awareness, the types of suppliers that are around. Um, I know in some emerging markets, one area that is really important is um, building capacity among um, uh, technology suppliers and um, uh, folks that service like solar panels and service the energy efficiency um, you know, um, technology investments. So uh, it really depends kind of what's happening in the market, um, but it's hard to imagine that um, uh, a green investment bank model could be as successful as it could potentially be without ensuring that other complementary parallel efforts are, are in place to build awareness and scale up um, adoption and build pipeline. Great, Stacey. Uh, thank you so much. I, I couldn't agree more that you know financing on its own is is not what gets you there, and so pairing it with technical assistance and market development strategies is is really critical. And those kinds of uh, forms of market support uh, can be housed within and executed by a green investment bank or done in partnership with other private sectors. But you you definitely do need both. Um, so I, looking at the clock, I think we're out of time. So I want to thank everybody so much for joining. Um, I hope you all found this informative um, and this concept to be exciting. Um, the paper is available um, on the Green Bank Network website and this uh, presentation will be posted there as well for anybody that you think uh, might be interested in seeing the webinar. Um, again, we'll be hosting this webinar again in a couple of weeks for folks on the opposite side of the world. Um, and just want to thank you all again for your interest and uh, hope everybody has a good day.